Hi guys, um, welcome to day four of remote learning. Today your task is to do the first read of Baseball in April, which is the second short story in the collection, and write, find the um, main idea and the theme. So you're going to write down the main idea and the theme statement right on the first page of the story. Take a picture of it, send it to me, and I'll read them over and see what I think. So let's go ahead and get started. Make sure you're on the right page. We're on the second story, so it's baseball in April. Okay. You know what? Freddie had a question. He had said, why was the title of the book Baseball in April when it's only one of the stories? And I think that's probably just an author's choice. So the author, Gary Soto, probably just decided to name the collection after one of his short stories, and that's the one he chose. Um, Nothing really important, but it was a really good question, Freddie, so thank you for asking. Let's go ahead and get started. Baseball in April. The night before Michael and Jesse were to try out for the Little League team for the third year in a row, the two brothers sat in their bedroom listening to the radio, pounding their fists into their gloves and talking about how they would bend to pick up grounders or wave off another player or make the pop-up catch. This is the year, Michael said with the confidence of an older brother. He pretended to scoop up the ball and throw out a man racing to first. He pounded his glove, looked at Jesse, and asked, How'd you like that? When they reached Romaine Playground the next day, there were a hundred kids divided into lines by age group, nine, ten, and eleven. Michael and Jesse stood in one line, gloves hanging limp from their hands, and waited to have a large paper number pinned to their backs so that the field coaches would know who they were. Jesse chewed his palm as he moved up the line. When his number was called, he ran out onto the field to the sound of his black sneakers smacking against the clay. He looked at the kid still in line, then at Michael, who yelled, You can do it! The first grounder, a three-bouncer, spun off his glove into center field. Another grounder cracked off the bat and he scooped it up, but the ball rolled off his glove. Jesse stared at it before he picked it up and hurled it to first base. The next one he managed to pick up cleanly, but his throw made the first baseman leap into the air with an exaggerated grunt that made him look good. Three more balls were hit to Jesse, and he came up with one. His number flapped like a broken wing as he ran off the field to sit in the bleachers and wait for Michael to trot onto the field. Michael raced after the first grounder and threw it on the run. On the next grounder, he lowered himself to one knee and threw nonchalantly to first. As his number, a crooked 17, flapped on his back, he saw a coach make a mark on his clipboard. Michael lunged at the next hit, but missed, and it skidded into center field. He shaded his eyes after the next hit, a high pop-up, and when the ball came down, he was there to slap it into his glove. His mouth grew fat from trying to hold back a smile. The coach made another mark on his clipboard. When the next number was called, Michael jogged off the field with his head held high. He sat next to his brother, both dark and serious, as they watched the other boys trot on and off the field. Finally, the coaches told them to return after lunch for batting tryouts. Michael and Jesse ran home to eat a sandwich and talk about what to expect in the afternoon. Don't be scared, Michael said, with his mouth full of ham sandwich though he knew Jesse's batting was no good. He showed him how to stand, he spread his legs, worked his left foot into the carpet as if he were putting out a cigarette, and glared at where the ball would come from, twenty feet in front of him near the kitchen table. He swung an invisible bat, choked up on the handle, and swung again. He turned to his younger brother. Got it? Jesse said he thought he did, and imitated Michael's swing, until Michael said, Yeah, you got it. Jesse felt proud walking to the playground, because the smaller kids were in awe of the paper number on his back. It was as if he were a soldier going off to war. Where you go in? asked Rosie, sister of Johnny Cerna, the playground bully. She had a large bag of sunflower seeds and spat out a shell. Tryouts, Jesse said, barely looking at her as he kept stride with Michael. At the diamond, 
Jesse once again grew nervous. He got into the line of nine-year-olds and waited for his turn at bat. Fathers clung to the fence, giving last-minute instructions to their kids. By the time it was Jesse's turn, he was trembling and trying to catch Michael's eye for reassurance. He walked to the batter's box, tapped the bat on the plate, something he had seen many times on television, and waited. The first pitch was outside and over his head. The coach laughed. He swung hard at the next pitch, spinning the ball foul. He tapped his bat again, kicked the dirt, and stepped into the batter's box. He swung at a low ball. Then he wound up and sliced the next ball foul to the edge of the infield grass, which surprised him because he didn't know he had the strength to send it that far. Jesse was given ten pitches and got three hits, all of them grounders to the right side. One grounder picked up one grounder kicked up into the face of a kid trying to field the ball. The kid tried to hang tough as he trotted off the field, head bowed, but Jesse knew tears were welling up in his eyes. Jesse handed the bat to the next kid and went to sit in the bleachers to wait for the ten-year-olds to bat. He was feeling better that than after that morning's fielding tryout because he had gotten three hits. He also thought he looked strong standing at the plate, bat high over his shoulder. Michael came up to the plate and hit the first pitch to third base. He sent the next pitch into left field. He talked to himself as he stood in the box, bouncing slightly before the next pitch, which he smacked into the outfield. The coach marked his clipboard. After his ten hits, he jogged off the field and joined his brother in the bleachers. His mouth was again fat from holding back a smile. Jesse was jealous of his brother's athletic display. He thought to himself, yeah, he'll make the team, and I'll just watch from the bleachers. He imagined Michael running home with a uniform under his arm while he walked home empty-handed. They watched other kids come to the plate and whack, foul, chop, slice, dribble, and hook balls all over the field. When a foul ball bounced into the bleachers, Jesse got it. He weighed the ball in his palm, in his palm like a pound of bologna and then hurled it back into the field. An uninterested coach watched roll by his feet. After it was over, they were told to expect a phone call by the end of the week if they had made the team. By Monday afternoon, they were already anxious for the phone to ring. They slouched in the living room after school and watched Double Dare on TV. Every time Jesse went into the kitchen, he stole a glance at the telephone. Once, when no one was looking, he picked it up to see if it was working and heard a long buzz. By Friday, when it was clear the call would never come, they went outside to the front yard to play catch and practice bunting. I should have made the team, Michael said as he made a stab at Jesse's bunt. Jesse agreed with him. If anyone should have made the team, it should have been his brother. He was the best one there. They hit grounders to each other. A few popped off Jesse's chest, but most disappeared neatly into his glove. Why couldn't I do this last Saturday, he wondered. He grew angry at himself, then sad. They stopped playing and returned inside to watch Double Dare. Michael and Jesse didn't make Little League that year, but Pete, a friend from school, told them about a team of kids from their school that practiced at Hobo Park near downtown. After school, Michael and Jesse raced to the park. They laid their bikes on the grass and took the field. Michael ran to the outfield, and Jesse took second base to practice grounders. Give me a baby roller, Danny Lopez, the third baseman, called. Jesse side-armed a roller, which Danny picked up on the third bounce. Good pickup, Jesse yelled. Danny looked pleased, slapping his glove against his pants as he hustled back to third. Michael practiced catching pop-ups with Billy Reeves until Manuel, the coach, arrived in his pickup. Most of the kids ran to let him know they wanted to play first, to play second, to hit first, to hit third. Michael and Jesse were quiet and stood back from the racket. Manuel pulled a duffel bag from the back of his pickup and walked over to the palm tree that served as a backstop. He dropped the bag with a grunt, clapped his hands, and told the kids to take the field. The two brothers didn't move. When Pete told the coach that Michael and Jesse wanted to play, Jesse stiffened up and tried to look strong. Because he was older and wiser, Michael stood with his arms crossed over his chest. 
You guys are in the outfield, the coach shouted, before turning to pull a bat and ball from the bag. Michael was middle-aged, patient, and fatherly. He bent down on his haunches to talk to the kids, spoke softly, and listened to what they had to say. He cooed, good, when they made catches, even routine ones. The kids knew he was good to them, because most of them didn't have fathers, or had fathers who were so beaten heart from hard work that they came home and fell asleep in front of the TV set. The team practiced for two weeks before Manuel announced their first game. Who are we playing? asked Pete. The Red Caps, he answered. West Fresno kids. What's our name? two kids asked. The Hobos, the coach said, smiling. In two weeks, Jesse had gotten better. But Michael quit the team because he found a girlfriend, a slow walker who hugged her books against her chest while gazing dreamily into Michael's equally dazed face. What fools, Jesse thought as he rode off to practice. Jesse was catcher and winced behind his mask when the batter swung because he had no chest protector or shin guards. Balls skidded off his arms and chest, but he never let on that they hurt. His batting, however, did not improve, and the team knew he was a sure out. Some of the older kids tried to give him tips, how to stand, follow through, and push his weight into the ball. Still, when he came up to bat, the outfielders moved in, like wolves moving in for the kill. Before their first game, some of the team members met early at Hobo Park to talk about how they were going to whip the Red Caps and send them home crying to their mothers. Soon, others showed up to field grounders while they waited for the coach. When they spotted him, they ran to his pickup and climbed at the sides. The coach stuck his head from the cab and warned them to be careful. He waited for a few minutes for the slow kids and waited for them to get in the front with him. As the team drove slowly to the west side, the wind running through their hair, they thought they looked pretty neat. When they arrived, they leaped from the pickup and stood by the coach, who waved to the other coach as he hoisted his duffel bag onto his shoulder. Jesse scanned the other team. Most were Mexican like his team, but they had a few blacks. The coach shook hands with the other coach. They talked quietly in Spanish, then roared with laughter and patted each other's shoulder. They turned around and furrowed their brows at the infield, which was muddy from a recent rain. Jesse and Pete warmed up behind the backstop, throwing gently to each other and trying to stay calm. Jesse envied the Red Caps, who seemed bigger and scarier than his team and wore matching t-shirts and caps. His team wore jeans and mismatched t-shirts. The Hobos batted first and scored one run on an error and a double to left field. Then the Red Caps batted and scored four runs on three errors. On the last one, Jesse stood in front of the plate, mask in hand, yelling, I gotta play, I gotta play. But the ball sailed over his head. By the time Jesse picked up the ball, the runner was already sitting on the bench, breathing hard and smiling. Jesse carried the ball to the pitcher. He searched his face and saw that Elias was scared. Come on, you can do it, Jesse said, putting his arm around the pitcher's shoulder. He walked back to the plate. He was wearing a chest protector that reached almost to his knees and made him feel important. The Red Caps failed to score any more that inning. In their second turn at bat, the Hobo scored twice on a hit and an error that hurt the Red Caps catcher. But by the sixth inning, the Red Caps were ahead 16 to 9. The Hobos began arguing with each other. Their play was sloppy, nothing like the cool routines back at their own field. Fly balls to the outfield dropped at the feet of open mouth players. Grounders rolled slowly between their legs. Even the pitching stank. You had to mess up, Menso, Danny Lopez shouted at the shortstop. Well, you didn't get a hit, and I did, the shortstop said, pointing to his chest. From the dugout, the coach told them to be quiet when they started cussing. Jesse came up to bat for the fourth time that afternoon with two men on and two outs. His teammates moaned because they were sure he was going to strike out or hit a pop-up. To make matters worse, the Red Caps had a new pitcher, and he was throwing hard. Jesse was almost as scared of the pitcher's fastball as he was of failing. 
The coach clung to the fence, cooing words of encouragement. His team yelled at Jesse to swing hard. Dig in, they shouted. And he dug in, bat held high over his shoulder. After two balls and a strike, the pitcher threw low and hard toward Jesse's thigh. Jesse stood still because he knew that was the only way he was going to get on base. The ball hit with a thud, and he went down holding his leg and trying to hold back the tears. The coach ran from the dugout and bent over him, rubbing his leg. A few of the kids on the team came over to ask, Does it hurt? Can I play catcher now? And let me run for him, coach. Jesse rose and limped to first. The coach shooed the team back into the dugout and jogged to the coach's box at first. Although his leg hurt, Jesse was happy to be on base. He grinned, looked up, and adjusted his cap. So this is what it's like, he thought. He clapped his hands and encouraged the next batter, their leadoff man. Come on, baby, come on, you can do it. The batter hit a high fly ball to deep center. While the outfielder backpedaled and made the catch, Jesse rounded second on his way to third, feeling wonderful to have gotten that far. Hobo Park lost 19 to 11 and went on to lose again. Oh, I'm sorry, and went on to lose against the Red Caps four more times that season. The Hobos were stuck in a two-league, two-team league. Jesse played until the league ended. Fewer and fewer of the players came to practice, and the team began using girls to fill in the gaps. One day, Manuel didn't show up with the, his duffel bag. On that day, it was clear to the four boys who remained that the baseball season was over. They threw the ball around, then got on their bikes and rode home. Jesse didn't show up the next day for practice. Instead, he sat in front of the TV watching Superman bend iron bars. He felt guilty, though. He thought that one of the guys might have gone to practice and discovered no one there. If he had, he might have waited on the bench or restless or something to do. He might have practiced pop-ups by throwing the ball into the air, calling, I got it, I got it, all by himself. So that's baseball in April. Just to clarify a little baseball rule, if a batter gets hit by a the ball, um, they automatically get to go to first. So that's what happened to Jesse during the game. Um, he was hit by the pitch and automatically got to go to first. So if you didn't know the rules of baseball, that's what happened. So go ahead and write your main idea and theme statement right on that first page, take a picture of it, show somebody at your house, have mom sign off, and um, send me the picture. Have a wonderful day. Talk to you later. Bye.